I'm going to hit go live. Go for it. I'm going to pull up my notes. I'm going to turn off my music. Keep it smooth. Here we go. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance. It's weekly scrap number 59. Special guest tonight is Andy Starnes. Uh, he is with Kill the Flashover, a lifelong student of the fire service, which he has been a part of for the last 28 years. That's my math, not his. So uh, he is an expert on the topics, thermal imaging, fire behavior, leadership, behavioral health, faith-based devotions. He has written numerous articles on these topics in every publication worth mentioning. He is the founder of bringingbackbrotherhood.org, nonprofit organization designed to encourage and provide guidance for firefighters. And probably one of the best compliments I've ever uh, received for a guest was when I posted that he was going to be the guest tonight. Kyle Romagus came on and said he has forgotten more knowledge than Kyle knows. So that's a huge compliment. And that is high praise considering the source. So with all of that being said, it's my pleasure, Chief Andy Starnes, to have you as the guest on Weekly Scrap number 59. Thank you for having me. I don't deserve such kind words, but. I'm thankful that I've got a lot of good people in my life and I pray that their uh, expertise rubs off on me because Kyle's a, a uh, rain man of knowledge. So for him to say that, I think he just, he must've just been having an off day because he's way smarter. Than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it, like I said, man, considering the source, it is a great compliment. So um, to, did I forget anything in the intro, anything you'd like to add? Well, my biggest thing is, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a fireman first. I'm married and I have a little girl. So my wife, uh, Sarah, is uh, holding the line at home. I work two full-time jobs. Basically, I work for the fire department full-time, and then I run Insight Training LLC, which is, you know, how I got into thermal engineering through Kill the Flashover. And my wife takes care of everything, including homeschooling our daughter, who is now 11. And we have a 21-foot trans transit van that we travel in now together. So it's a family business, if you will. Uh, she says she works with me, not for me. So, so, but, uh, yeah, that's, it's my faith, my family and the fire department in that order. And I've messed that up more than anything in my life. So I'm thankful that I have someone that keeps me in line and gives me good. She's basically my godly gift of discernment. If I ask her a question and she goes, mm, I don't know about that. I, I take heed to that because a couple of times I didn't and I've messed up. So she's, she's got the gift of discernment. So I'm very thankful for her. It gets to be your compass sometimes when needed. Oh, yeah, most of the time. <laughs> all right, that's fair. That is fair. And, again, you're blessed to have it, and we all are if, if we have that in our lives. Yes, sir. Uh, to everyone watching live, which we've already had, Reagan Underwood has said, good evening, gentlemen, and Gigi Galasso has already said good evening, so welcome. Um, to everyone watching live, if you have questions for Andy or myself, please do not hesitate to send them in the comments. And so with all of that being said, we are ready to get right wow. into the scrap. I will just lead off with the, the, the soft toss right out the gate, which is it is 2020. It's the year of craziness. Uh, how has it affected you? How has it affected the fire service for you? And, of course, teaching. Well, I mean, we we had a record-breaking year on the books as of January. And then come March, we had a record-breaking year in cancellations. So, um, you know, whether people believe it or not, it, it costs a lot of money to be an instructor. And the more stuff you accumulate and the more operating expenses you have, a, a lot of my friends take a beating because they charge to teach. And what most of them don't realize is you can't buy thermal imaging cameras, a van, uh, insurance on your guys, equipment, ticks, and all this stuff they think they give you for free. And you're going to go sit on it and do nothing with it. Because mm -hmm. I promised my family that this would never take from the table. It would never take from them as college fund. It would never take away from them. It would add. And if it didn't pay bills or, or break even, then I would stop doing it because I don't want to play fireman and take away from my family. So 2020 made a huge impact in us, but I can tell you that because of my wife encouraging me to put money back, um, I was able to stop and spend three months at home and do Corona projects basically. And we built a ninja course playground for our daughter. Very nice. I see. And now I have, I'm going to have carpal tunnel surgery next month because uh, I held a shovel and uh, uh, a pick in my hand for about three months. Right. But on. we worked, we worked hard and we got a lot of stuff done. And we still, as always, we still have a lot left to do. But um, 2020 was, is tough. But you know what? 
hard times can pull you together or hard times can pull you apart. Right on. And I'm very thankful that I learned a lot through this and I, I've learned not to depend on certain things and plan certain things that they can be taken away in an instant, just like your health. And, uh, you know, it's been a challenging year, but, you know, I like to say leadership without opposition, adversity or persecution is nothing more than a title. Ooh, I like that. So if you, if you haven't faced hard times, you really haven't been in a position of leadership yet. Just wait. Just give It'll it time. <laughs> no. Time. Now my question for you on that is, can you pass the ninja course? Uh, can I pass it? Yeah. No, the monkey bars, I can make it about three quarters across, but then it has this bar that drops down. And when I try to reach over, I think light duty. I've done that for a year and a half, <laughs> right. not going back. <laughs> but we did put eight inches of rubber mulch down for when I fall, not for when they fall. Okay. Uh, but it's an eight foot drop. It's pretty good. <laughs> no doubt. But right. the, the four-year-old next door is better at it than I am. <laughs> has to do with them rubbery bones man i'm telling you it's, oh they're not a, they're not a, they're not afraid either they just bounce you know? uh, jacob johnson said hello gents jamie barker chiming in said good evening from great falls airport matthew klein said good evening andy how are you this evening and scott simmons said i am so excited about this as am i scott so scott scott's good man i know reagan and half those guys thank you is it safe to call you a thermal imaging guru i would consider myself an educated consumer I, I do not ever, people like to give you the terms like subject matter expert. I think when you give yourself that label, you need to go home. It's like saying I'm, I'm an awesome firefighter. Or I'm a great at this or great at that. You are striving to be great. As Paul says in the Bible, I'm, I'm striving for perfection. Everybody should be striving for better. I'll never reach perfection. Look at me. I got no hair, 45 years old. I'm fighting the, the, you know, I got, I got a CPAP machine, a, I had to take my pills, all the stuff, a workout, do all that, and I'm just fighting that battle. But point being is, we all have to work hard at something that we love to stay good at it. Just like a relationship takes work. You want to be a good firefighter, you don't go to work and sit in a recliner. So for me, thermal imaging. If you look, if you could see to my left of my desk, I have nine white little binders like this thing right here, and. They're full of papers and research papers that I constantly print, reread, and read and learn. And if you want to know how I got into it, I mean, I just read the instructions. Wow. And that's how I know 75 different cameras. That's how I've got into industrial cameras. Uh, optical gas imaging is next on my list. Drones. You don't stop. Right. When you stop, you become irrelevant and you're not up to date and you're a Tyrannosaurus Rex and somebody runs over you. I want to keep learning and keep challenging myself. And I got 12 guys working for me and they, they depend on me to give good information. And you know what? They teach me more than I teach them because they're subject matter experts in search and writ and all these different things. And I'm just the tick guy. I'm the one that when they can't remember a specific thing about a brand, I'm the one to help, help with that. But yes, I, I play with overpriced price flashlights or captain Dave Wagner, the uh, fire, uh, the fire guru, calls them thermal imaginers or he used to thermal uh, imaginers. Now, now he's a he's a thermal imaging fan he's one of my heroes i like it uh, so that it's been a journey it really is it's just like that picture behind me you see two firefighters holding the cameras i want to help firefighters do their job faster better safer more intelligently aggressive and for me going in a house and searching blind for my kid is not good enough because the military uses everything they got to go get the bad guy. Why are we not using everything we have to get the good guy? And I've learned so much. And every time I take another class, an industrial class, I feel like, to quote Jimmy Brown, a good friend of mine, I feel like a caveman holding a flashlight. Every time I get through another class, I'm like, the rest of the world is doing all of this with thermal imaging. And all we're doing, quote Joe DeVito, is search and overhaul. Something's wrong with that. No, I feel you. I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm already enjoying the preaching. Uh, it's going to get worse. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. I've no, no, dude. I, again, do not be afraid. Um, we're already getting questions coming at you, and you've been called the Yoda of thermal imaging by Kevin O'Donnell. So yeah, that's tell Kevin to go away. <laughs> <laughs> He's he has he has he has information on me no one else should have. We'll get tell him dirt. I'll buy him ice cream if he'll be quiet. All right, we'll get the dirt. <laughs> I'll put a like on that one so I can get the dirt later. Um, He's a good man. We've got we got questions to get to, and I will get to them. Uh, Jason Hoffman said, "Andy Andrew Starnes is a true gentleman, great person in fire service ambassador." Matt Foster said, "A true leader right there." 
Um, I don't deserve that. And Scott Simons has uh, said, we have a serious issue addressing the use of ticks in training. Yes, sir. He's correct. Scott's a brilliant man, too. So let me hit you with the first thing I want to hit you with, which is the top misconceptions. You, I mean, you've taught a lot of classes on thermal imaging. The top misconceptions that you hear repeated as you teach. I wrote, a, I wrote an article about that called uh, uh, "Myths and Myths, Top 10 Myths and Misconceptions for International Firefighting Magazine. And the issue with that is a lot of, and this is not just thermal imaging, but in general, we as firefighters like to pass along anecdotal data. Somebody told me, this guy told me, it's kind of like the rumor mill. Right. We the believe it. Game. Yeah, we believe it because credible XYZ firefighters said it, right? And that's the danger of social media or anything. I read something and I take it as the gospel and I go with it. It's like watching a YouTube video and thinking I'm suddenly an expert. Right. But the problem with thermal imaging was if you look back far enough, when they first came onto the scene for fire service use, they were about $30,000. And part of that money went to train you. Safe IR, the godfathers of thermal imaging, they were doing the training. And then the manufacturers kind of got greedy and they quit paying. Well, what's the smallest budget in the fire department, Corley? Training. Oh, yeah. So does that make any sense? You got million dollar fire trucks, multi million dollar stations, all this equipment, and you got, you know, not even a percentage, right. a small percentage, 1%, 3%. Of your budget goes to training how are we supposed to stay good at something so there was there hasn't been any formalized thermal imaging training or education since then other than safe ir or when in 2012 when you had the nfpa standard nfpa 1801 came in and then the actual training standard came in in 2015 right and i don't know but about 10 departments that are actually reading or following that or even know it exists yeah, and it's 40 bucks. I mean, right. you spend more on taking your family to Chick-fil-A, um, read it. And you can read it for free online, and you'll you'll see words like, you shall do these things. And basically, what it says, Corley, is you shall carry a thermal engine camera when you do the task that you normally do, whether it's size up, making entry, flowing water, all those things. But there's this big part in there about you shall have practical classroom and hands-on training before it's placed on the fire truck. How many fire departments do that? No. They put it on a truck and six months later, they go, oh, by the way, we need to train you on how to use this life-saving device. This is how you turn it on right here. Yeah, that's right. That's what my, my department said. We just need to tell them how to turn it on. And I went, oh, that hurts me. I'd rather have a root canal. Which what's that? Miscon- go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to no, say mis- it goes, <laughs> yeah, I'll be quiet. I promise. <laughs> Misconceptions, though, it's not a thermometer, first of all. Corona should taught us anything in that. There have been fire departments using it to try to measure body temperatures with it. It is not a thermometer. It is a what's known as qualitative thermography. There's two types of thermography. Thermography is the study of remote contact or remote measurement of a surface. In other words, I want to I want to measure something, but I can't touch it because it's dangerous. So there's two types, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative means you're checking your kid's temperature to see exactly are they going to school or are they staying home? Right. You know, right? 98 degrees versus 99 ain't going to school. A fire service tick doesn't do that. It's qualitative, which means I'm looking for anomalies or something that's wrong. In other words, it's not going to be exact. It could be several hundred degrees off depending on the environment and variables and lots of other things. Point being, firefighters have trusted it a too much or not trusted it enough. And when they read that little number in the bottom right hand corner known as the spot temperature, a lot of them use that as their overall measurement. And that's sure. a bad idea in the fire ground. Anyways, there's uses for the spot temperature, but in general, firefighters have gotten into trouble by calling out all oh, I ask them how hot it is. When they look at the ceiling, I hear 184 degrees. I'm like, give me the camera. <laughs> and I put a Walmart smiley face sticker over the spot temperature. I want them to read the whole picture, right? Interpret levels of grayscale, colorization, moving convection currents. And they don't understand how to interpret that. And what's that little green triangle mean in the upper left-hand corner? Why does it keep freezing? I thought it was broken. No, it's not broken. It's trying to adjust to the heat. In other words, all of this and more comes into play that firefighters don't understand how the camera works or the key attributes of it so they can interpret what's in front of them. If they can interpret what that data is, they can better interpret the environment and diagnose thermal severity, where the fire is, 
where the victim is. They can locate and find the victim up to 70% faster, put the fire out up to 70% faster, flow more water where it's needed versus scream and shout and spray water all about, like Chief Fling says, right. and realize they're in the wrong apartment. You know, it's all about being what we call intelligently aggressive and carrying the camera and doing something. I'll bet you, Corley, you do every time you take your loved one and go across the street. You simply hold their hand and look both ways. We right. shove firefighters into zero or near zero visibility and expect them to perform flawlessly with no roadmap, no mental map, no vision whatsoever, if they have any, and say, go in there and find a fire or go find the victim. How about we do this? How about you just simply look in there and say, oh, this is a child's room. There's a nurse. There's a uh, crib in the far right hand corner to your two o'clock. And there is a closet door to your 11 o'clock. See that? All right, go get them. Right on. What did you just do for them? Oh, effectively. I don't want to throw them. Yeah, I don't want to throw them on camera in their hand. I want them to go to work. But you're, you're the orchestra conductor. You're the crew leader. You're responsible for guiding them. How are you supposed to do that in zero visibility with gear that protects you so well you can't feel anything? No, that's, zero, that's, that's a beautiful I mean, point. And and it's not for the lack of effort from the guys. They'll gladly dive off into it zero, and they do, and, and they perform admirably. But like you said, seventy yeah. percent more effective with it. So just imagine that. Boston FDNY in Chicago in the nineties did a study, and without the tick, they missed the victim six out of ten times. Now you think these are the guys and gals that make rescues every day, and it, they gave them two scenarios. They went in with the camera. They found the victim ninety nine percent of the time, seventy percent faster. We went in without the camera. They missed the victim six out of 10 times. Now you fast forward to today because they haven't done a, a really good study since then. Right. We have firefighters missing the victim today because they're not trained and they're, they're holding the camera wrong, literally standing up. Don't understand high and low sensitivity and how that affects how the victim is. And they're training firefighters to search for a victim in fake or cold smoke and heating up bodies or mannequins and saying, look, you're going to see a white hot victim in a fire. No, you're not. More than likely, that victim is going to be dark or blend in with the background, depending on the background and the body temperature. I can take my hand and put it in front of a fire, and my hand will look dark. I'll move my hand away from the fire, and my hand looks white. My hand didn't change temperature. The background did. Environment. And you got to think about it. If that person is dead and been dead a while, their body's no longer an active emitter. They will blend in with the background, just like your turnout gear. If you sit in there long enough, you'll blend in with the background because you're saturated. Where if you're recently deceased or you're still alive, your body's trying to regulate temperature. So 98.6 degrees in a 300 degree room, you're going to show up dark. dark. Yeah. They don't train firefighters to do that. No. And that's, that's this is part of that realistic training that we got to work on. No doubt. And that's what I was going to bring up with Scott Simon's thing about serious issues addressing the use of ticks in training, the cold smoke, the, the fog yep. machines. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And, um, and there's a lot of things that go along with that. You can use fake smoke for a lot of things. Don't get me wrong. I don't want people to think, well, I just got to throw out a fake smoke machine. But in general, if you're going to use a thermal imaging camera, you need a heat source. And if you're in a non-heated environment where everything's the same temperature, you can literally make the camera blind if you don't know what you're doing but we can teach you how to overcome that. It's, it's only as good as the person holding it. Like when I teach in my uh, aggressive attack class, intelligently aggressive attack, I say, it's not the nozzle. It's the nozzle man. Nozzleman. Yeah. It's the person holding it. That makes the difference. I like how it. well trained are they? All right. I got some questions to throw at you coming at you from people here. And Nate Schuler wants to know when or if do you believe mask ticks will be standard in the fire service? Uh, probably by the time I retire three years from now, Should be... if, if he wants to really know, tell him to watch this. There's two standards right now in NFPA when, regarding thermal imaging cameras, at least right now, every time that standard changes, guess who has to keep up with it? The manufacturer. So if you buy an NFPA certified camera and that standard is revised, then they have to meet the new standard, right? Right. Well, what standard is currently under revision that's supposed to have been released already this year? NFPA 1801 2020 edition, which is the thermal imaging camera standard for the fire service. Okay. So I would bet the next time that standard is revised, two to three years, there will be an addition for integrated mask thermal imaging cameras or ITICs or mask mounted thermal imaging cameras, whichever brand you decide to follow. Point being, 
they're going more where things are all integrating us. If you hadn't picked up on it, we got heads up displays, we got blinky lights and laptops on the truck. You got technology and everything. And I hear these guys, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to rely on technology. I was like, no, I don't want you to. But if you're really not into technology, see this little uh, device you carry everywhere. I'm going to take it away from you for a month and see how you behave. Yeah, you function. Yeah. Well, I can't play Candy Crush in the toilet anymore. No, you can't. You have to go we, back to reading we, shampoo bottles. We, yeah, we use technology in everything we do. Right. It's the, the issue is, are you fundamentally sound first? Because the thing we say all the time is, a thermal engine camera does not replace a well-trained firefighter. It merely enhances what they do, makes them more effective, or to quote my instructor, Thomas Anderson, when I look through the window doing vendor search, I'm more than lock, likely not going to see the victim, but I'm going to see where the victim might be. Might be. The bed, a pile of clothes, the door. You're giving them a layout, a map, that unless you don't have infrared vision, only a snake does. And a snake around my, my house, dead. So I want to be able to see and make a difference. You know, I, yes, I want you to be fundamentally sound in your search methodology, whether you're you know, oriented search or tick directed or however you do it. But point being, why would you not want to do it better, faster and get the victim out? Because all the guys who preach the same stuff in Venator search and aggressive search or searchable versus survival to quote Sean Duffy, how long that victim stays in there decreases their chances of survival. So for every minute they're in there, it's going down. So why would you not want to improve that by simply going, hey, Coley, that victim's right there. Will right you go there. get it? No, and you're not talking a small percentage either when you're saying 70% from an old study. I mean, that is a massive, massive mm -hmm. jump. It's not like 5% increase. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, it's solid. Um, let me find the next question, which is top three. Now, the, again, everything is you, – you take these <laughs> questions that are throwing at you at your – Luis Manuel Corona says top three ticks in your opinion. Four, well, five of them, mush them together, make one, sell it to you, and move to Tahiti. But can't do that. Uh, if, so here, here's the thing. I got I got tired of an, ask or answering that question because everybody wants, like I told you in the intro, everybody wants to know which one to buy. Right. If there was only one good one, that's all I would know. But unfortunately, none of them are perfect. Right now, the two best pitchers on the market are between a Bullard and a Fleer. And I'm not talking about the lower end ones. I'm talking about a Fleer K53 to a K65 or a Bullard NXT or a QXT. You're not going to get a prettier picture than either one of those right now. Now, there's some older cameras in use that are still amazing, like a Draeger UCF 9000, one of my favorite teaching cameras, but it's the size of Thor's hammer. Uh, it has It's like an Xbox game. It has toggle switches. It records audio, by the way, from a long distance. Um, it does things that other cameras don't. Right. But if I was to take my top picks, I would take those two that I've previously mentioned, the Draeger. I'd take the Scott X380 and the, the uh, Cold Spot Tracker it has. I'd take the Bullard housing because it's indestructible. Uh, and then I would take, um, let's see, Bullard, Fleer, Scott X380. Uh, I would take Draeger's recording feature where it does audio, visual, and video. Make that automatic and take out all the bells and whistles and just have one button. I'd have a one button camera that was lightweight and had a large viewfinder and a battery that actually lasted and was not mounted in a truck. That, that would be pretty much it. That is it. That is the top one. Mm -hmm. that would, I'd put those together and make that one. And, and the thing that I would do differently, Corley, is I'd make, make it in a camera. It has two temperature modes, high and low sensitivity, just like your eye goes from dilated to constricted. Right. So it can see better. I would, work on trying to find a balance between the two, because if you look at cameras in general, they either perform exceptionally well in high sensitivity or poor in low sensitivity or vice versa. Neither one of them performs well on either spectrum. So why can't we figure out a way to make it perform better? And I can tell you the way it can is simply stepping up the resolution one more notch, because here's a, here's something, a G whiz factoid for you. The best camera on the market resolution right now, is a 320 by 240, which is 76,800 pixels, even though there are cameras in fire service wise that are higher in that resolution, but best picture wise is that one. In industry, that's not even considered low resolution. The minimum in industry or industrial thermography is 640 by 480, which is 300,000 pixels. Wow. We're not even, we're not even at that. 
right. you know, there's drones and all kind of stuff. But put it this way: if you're searching for a victim with a 640 by 480, you could see a small child's hand at 175 feet. Oh wow! Is it, is, it, is it strictly just the the, the budget? The, the monetary cost or what's the, what's the story? I the honestly think it's demand. I mean, I mean, yeah, budget comes into play, but it couldn't cost them any more because they're in production. The issue is the fire service doesn't a ask for it or want it. And B, if you look at, there's only 35,000 fire departments and only a handful of them are buying cameras. So 70% of the United States fire service had a thermal imagery by 2015, which means 9,000 departments didn't have one. So that means, you got about $20 million worth of sales when you add up all the, the fire service ticks manufacturers together that they're all fighting for that one pot. Right. And you, you take a company like FLIR that sold $4 billion worth of cameras, $12 million is pocket change. Right. Now. And Bullard sold like $8 million. So yeah, they, they sell cameras, but is that really their focus? Right. No, right. that's why. Cause it's not, it's not even a priority to them. And if until it becomes a priority, Corley, until litigation spurs regulation, in my opinion, right. you won't right. see it change because there's too many people focused on all these other things, which make us better. Don't get me wrong, skills wise, but I don't see anybody think saying, "Well, what could we do to help firefighters do their job better and give them clarity and visual visual diagnostics in an environment that they don't normally have it?" Sure, zero visibility environment with you know cut off from your senses. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a truth bomb. Um, <laughs> William Ball said, keep paying it forward, Andy. I look forward to everything you post daily. Thank you. Um, right. Trenton Slattery is asking, our department is currently exploring new SCBA options, and I was curious as to your thoughts and accuracy on the integrated ticks uh, with the MSA G1 and the Scott mask that have it built in. Currently, what he's describing is probably the question you wanted to ask, or you want me to go ahead and answer that sure, about sure. situation wise? All right, so there's two types of ticks being marketed to the fire service, and I say marketed. So there's situational awareness cameras and there's decision making cameras. I did not come up with the term situational awareness, despite some of the people who think I did. That came from a manufacturer's mouth, not mine. The sole purpose of a situational awareness camera was to prevent firefighter disorientation. You want a great read on that? Look up Preventing Firefighter Disorientation Study by William Mora. Mora. And if you want to spend 80 bucks, you can buy the book called Preventing Firefighter Disorientation, published by Penwell. And it's got some great information for people like you, Corley, who are in the battalion chief role about when we pull up on some of these buildings on the key things we look for. And it has even a disorientation sequence. Nice. So the point, the point of that is what you'll find out is the data shows, even in uh, Don Abbott's Mayday studies, we like to get door disoriented and lost a lot. And we, we preach, stay on a hose line, stay on a wall, stay on a search rope, stay with a designated adult. But every time something bad happens, we're not anywhere. On right. Those. We're in a closet. And, no, and nobody's teaching secondary means of orientation either. Like what happens when I do get lost? A friend of mine, Jeff Dykes makes this hundred dollar little device called a Northern star that you can put in your, in your face piece. It's not a camera. It's a compass compass. It's a digital compass, hundred bucks. Okay. And if I go into 80,000 square foot warehouse and I go in facing North, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a sailor or someone who's good at directions. Ask my wife. But if I know I turn around and go South, south will get which you way out. am I going? Yeah. South will get back you. Or, yeah. At least the way you came. came. That's right. And, and so those are the things that are not being taught and preventing firefighter disorientation was the original purpose, supposedly, of a situational awareness camera, such as MSAI tick, Scott site, FLIR K2, K1, Seek Fire Pro, and whatever's gonna come out next week, I have no idea. Point being though, situational awareness means being able to find my way, find my crew, find my fire, find my way out. Why would I want a device that says it'll do that, but the refresh rate on it's so low that when I scan, it can't keep up and cause me to miss critical things like the fire, my way out, my crew, or the things it said it would help me to do. So if those, those devices are not 30 Hertz, I wouldn't buy them period. You know, because if I have a nine Hertz camera, right? Think about it. The IC is 27 Hertz. One Hertz is one frame per second. When you scan, it can't keep up. And if you see heat, when it switches from high to low sense, 
or nukes or shutters in that process, it will lag or take even longer. Like one particular brand takes five and a half seconds to switch from high to low sensitivity. Corley, on your years of service, have you ever met a patient firefighter in a fire? Right. Okay. Five and a half seconds yeah. is an eternity. Yeah. And think about when you're trying to find your way out, when you're in trouble. So when he asked which one I would buy, I'm, I'm not pro on any of them right now because they're not up to snuff, no matter which one it is, because they're all low resolution. They have value. I mean, they're great for spot checking and finding my way out if I can do that. But I'm going to tell you, if you're using it to scan and look around, it's not going to keep up. So the MSAI tick, for example, is the only one that's 30 hertz. The rest of them are 9 hertz, 15 hertz, not, uh, barely 8 hertz in one of them. And you know why that is? It's not because they're trying to rip you off. It's because of a law called ITAR, International Trades and Arms Regulation Law, which basically says if you go outside of the U.S. and Canada, you can't have anything but a nine hertz camera because it's military grade technology gotcha. and you don't want a bad guy sitting in the bushes tracking your family with a 30 hertz camera or greater, which is most fire, most decision making cameras. The ones that go in your hand poorly or a company officer's hands are 30 hertz, 60 hertz. As a matter of fact, NFP 1801 says it has to be a minimum of 25 or 27 hertz, which is what your eye sees. Right. Yeah. So when he asked which one, both of them have their flaws, but like MSAI tick has a 30 Hertz processor, which is great, but none of the color palettes in it are designed for fire attack. They're all thermography based color palettes for building professionals like iron bow, rainbow, uh, fire and ice. None of those work well in a fire. So they saturate and produce this blobby grainy image that doesn't allow the firefighter to see any detail. So why I wrote a six page PDF explaining each color palette because I got this question so much. And the only one I would use would be white hot just because it gives me more detail. And that core is made by another manufacturer. MSA doesn't even make it. Oh, wow. Same so, thing with Scott. Are we just so. the forgotten stepchildren because the, the lack of interest slash. Uh, that's all. Okay. Money. There it is. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. All about money. What can I make? Out. What can I make the cheapest thing and put in everybody's hand? Think about it this way, Corley. There's 1.1 million firefighters, right? Right. If I can put a tick in every one of those hands, just like a cell phone, and it's a throwaway one, and a couple years later you got to buy a new one, think about the profit behind that. Sure. When you can make one of those for a hundred bucks and sell it for a thousand, okay. Think about that. Whereas a decision-making camera, you're going to spend between three thousand and ten thousand dollars. Okay. Departments that are hurting budget wise are not going right. to buy a lot of those and they're going to stick with it a long time. A long time. Long yeah. Where life. I could buy a K1 for 600 bucks or a Seek Fire Pro for, I think I saw them the other day for 450 or something ridiculous. Where was that when I bought them? I bought 12 <laughs> of them for 799. Where, what, <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> Well, I couldn't wait for be on sale, but yes, go ahead. I know. No, I'm going to find the next question. Uh, Matthew Klein, oh, we're replying to Jacob to uh, be safe, be safe. Biggest thing. I'm looking, I'm looking. Good information from Gigi Galasso. We've got be safe. Uh, Scott Simon says survivability profiling should not be a bad word. That definitely deserves a like. Uh, what do you think on, what's your words on that? Depends on how you interpret it. I, you know, too many people look at survivability profiling by a subjective measurement, because if I show up and I got 25 years on the job, lots of lots of experience and I know my building construction, I'm well trained in fire behavior and I do a full 360 with a camera. You might be able to determine what parts of the building are thermally severe and which parts are collapsing. But does that mean that someone wouldn't be alive in there? No. But. The difference is, what if I'm a five-year person with not much experience and I show up and 40% of the building's on fire? How many times have you seen people say fully involved, fully involved? Right. Fully involved. Think about this, too. The close before you doze message has been pushed big time by UL. Think sure. about all the pictures that we've seen behind a closed door. What did that room look like? Yeah. Tenable. Barely made it to 100 degrees, right? Absolutely. What about kids? They hide in closets, behind bathroom doors. There's lots of survivable space, right? Ask Ryan Pennington, the hoarding expert. Uh, I believe it was Chief Rob Fling's fire. They had rode off a hoarding fire, went defensive, and went in into a recovery mode and was cleaning out the room 
of this massive pile of stuff when all of a sudden this woman reached out from underneath the magazine piles and grabbed a firefighter's leg because wow. she was alive wow. underneath all that because she was shielded. Right, protected. So the problem with survivability profiling is, yes, the data when we talk about thermal and we talk about uh, collapse, but there's way too many other variables that we can't study because in America you can do whatever you want in your house as long as you don't cause adverse impact to your neighbor. You can have a motorcycle shop in your living room. You could have seven feet of stuff in your room. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. And that changes the game. You can renovate your house without a permit. Right. You can you can create voids and look what about these kids' rooms they're building in attics with secret doors on them. Right. Right? They look like a bookcase and kids up there fine. Kids love it. Um, yeah, I mean it's a great idea. I wish I'd thought of it. But point being is survivability profiling definitely needs more study. But the problem is is it's like the word transitional attack. You say it and people start losing their mind. We're not saying don't search. We're not saying don't attack the fire. We're saying use some common sense when you look at a building and say, if the building's gone, what part of it could I check? I got a friend who works in a department that has 6,000 vacant or condemned structures in his first due. Ooh. So how do you think he searches? He takes a, a tater rake or a long hook, flips it over and puts the handle through the window and searches around the window in some of these because there's not even floors in some of them. Wow. The building's gone, but he's still trying to right, serve. Right, right, right. He's giving it a shot. The way I think about it is, think about it if it was your child, your spouse, what efforts would you make to ensure that you did everything you could that you could check areas that possibly could have someone, right? No, oh, absolutely. I know too many people, including myself, that lay my head down at night and go, I should have done this. I should have done that. And survivability profiling, yes. I think you could somebody could do a doctoral thesis on it. And Stephen Marshall's work on it from FDNY is a great read if you hadn't looked into it. Some of my data about what happens to a victim in a fire comes from his work. Um, Sean Duffy's quoted some of the same things where it talks about if a human victim ble breathes in 185 degrees of superheated gases in their trachea for 20 seconds, they're more than likely dead. Right. But that doesn't mean that I look down this hallway that's full of smoke, but that kid laying on the floor is dead. Right. Right. We, we have to give them the best chance we can by finding them faster and getting them out of that ideal H environment. The question we should be asking is this, not whether or not it's survival or not whether or not it's searchable is, can you find them? And can you find them in a fast enough manner Come that you could get in and get them out before the building falls in or before it flashes? Because if you're basing it on your ears or your spotty senses or your lack of vision, that's not good enough in my opinion. And I got data to back it up because I'm not smart enough to risk your life or your family's life on my opinion. I like Don't. it. That's strong. That's strong stuff, Steve. That is very strong stuff. Uh, I'm going to catch up here. Ben right. Jones said, will this be available as a recording? Absolutely. It'll be on Facebook. It'll be on YouTube. Uh, and it'll be available also in podcast form. Uh, any place you get podcasts. Nate Schuler said, thank you, Andy. Vince Music, we are currently using Scott Mask thermal cameras. We use it in conjunction with a handheld tick. Good. Uh, Don't just use one. Use both. It's like a throwdown gun. I got to have both. Without strong basics, don't think technology will make up the difference. Technology enhances. I think that's a strong message you have definitely preached. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe in technology replacing a well-trained firefighter. The analogy I always use is: How many times have you went somewhere with this little device, your cell phone, and used that as your sole source of navigation for a family trip? Oh yeah. And what happened when you really needed it the most? <laughs> Battery was quit. dead or it lost connection. It's working. Paul Combs has a cartoon I always quote, shows three firefighters and zero visibility. And the center one goes, man, the tick quit working. Anybody remember how to do an oriented search? Hello? Hello? Anybody? You know, I always say the designated adult was not chosen that morning at shift change, evidently, because the designated adult is the one that's supposed to know where we're going, how many doors we passed, secondary means of egress, who's the heaviest breather. That's why that person should not be doing another task because they have to process all of that and they have to watch over you and their nozzle and the one behind them. And they have to keep in mind all of that data and constantly process it and think of ways to get you out. If plan a doesn't work, 
And that requires somebody who has critical thinking and who is staying situationally aware. And data shows if you're doing a task, you can't do multiple things at once. Right. Start losing that vision. Yep. Dirk Janiak asks, a great camera would sell worldwide, wouldn't it? Question mark. Yes, it could. Yeah. A great, great, great. He said a great camera would sell worldwide, wouldn't it? Is that right. what he said? That was the question. Kind of a, a, a statement phrased to a question at the end. Okay, I asked Dirk this. How many great nozzles or branches have been sold? How many great SCBAs have been sold? Everybody loves a wireframe Scott pack. They would love to go back to that, right? Right. Everybody loves a simple 7 8 tip smoothboard. It's, it's, it's simple, it's beautiful, right? Uh, it, it, everybody loves, you know, they used to like hip boots and cotton jacket coats. By the way, I'd fix most fire behavior problems if you put me back in that because then people would open the nozzle when they got hot. I love but that. A great I love that. You can say that twice. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, you're not going to crawl in there and take a beat. And sorry, um, you know, a, an open nozzle was a survivable space too. By the way, Brian Brush preaches that in his 75 years of fire stream. Point mm-hmm. being is a great camera in even better hands is what I want. Because dirt, if you had an MSA 5000 like my department had for 15 years, which is low resolution, but it's a hardy camera, takes a beating. That's better in well-trained hands than the highest resolution, most expensive camera you got on the market with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing because they, they won't know how to carry it. They won't know how to look. They won't know how to increase the field of view. They'll stand up with it, stand up, staying low. It'll white out, as they say, because of moisture and saturation of, of getting on the lens, not because of heat. And they won't know to wipe the lens. I had more firefighters come to me and say, a lot of cameras junk. It, it quit working. I'm like, well, explain to me, what do you mean quit working? Well, I walked in, I could see they opened the nozzle and it quit working. I'm like, really? Did you wipe your face piece? Oh, yeah. Do you ever think that the front of the camera has something called a lens on it? And if it got moisture on it, it can't see either. So every time you do this, you do this. And if you don't, you won't. And you won't see. The image will degrade or go away. Because right. it can't see through technically anything. It's long wave infrared radiation passing through smoke. It doesn't go through water. It doesn't go through solid objects. So a great camera. Yes, I agree, Dirk. I'd love to see one that changes the game. And I'm hoping someone from overseas, a company that rhymes, rhymes with Drager, might be doing something about that. So we'll see. <laughs> uh, throwing some challenges at the manufacturers. Hint, hint, are you listening? <laughs> I like this question coming at you. It's from Garrett Toes at... And Garrett, if I said your last name wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, if there's only one tick on the engine, I'm sure you get this a lot, so this will be soft toss to you. Who takes it? The officer, company for, officer. officer for the 360 or the entry team? Company officer all day long. Okay. Here's why. If you drill and you're an aggressive company, like I know most of the people probably listening are, then when the company officer, he or she comes off the rig, A, they're taking a quick look, probably already got a windshield view as they drove by. They're starting their 360. The guys or gals are running to the side or the back of the rig and they're starting their stretch and they're stretching based on conditions and they're taking the irons and the hose to the door. So if they're already doing that and they, I'm at the door and the company officer can complete a 360 in 60 to 90 seconds, and you can get water to that nozzle in 60 to 90 seconds. Who should be coming around back to that door at the same time so they could be with the crew? Right. I hear more times than not. Oh, I don't want to hold my guys up. I'm going to let them go. Okay, so you're telling me you let your kid go without, without looking. You saw they didn't. And then they're using sound and stream placement and their ears and lots of other things to guide them. Why not do this? Do that quick 360. Have them at the door. And here's something that most of them do not do. While they're waiting, Corley, for you, They got to check their nozzle and bleed the pattern, right? Or bleed the air out and check the pattern, right? Yes, sir. Everyone I watch does this. They they water the grass. If you're going to force that door and 26% of all victims are found within so many feet of an egress point, how bad would you feel if while I'm doing my 360, you're just sitting at the door and grandma's laying on the other side of the door dying for air? Force the door, do what you normally do, sweep behind the door, and if you don't see anybody and you're underneath the flow path in the in the intake, open that nozzle on the door frame before you open it, and then open that nozzle in the, uh, in the air intake and flow water for 15, 20 seconds, then close the door. 
Because I bet you, if you have a grill fire tonight when you're cooking a burger or steak, you're not going to leave the lid off and run inside and get some water. Not unless you don't value your meat, your marriage, or your right. grill. You're going to throw water in there and close the lid. And you're going to let steam do the work, and you're going to let the gas contraction occur. And I, then we start the, well, you're going to steam the victim. Right, here we go. Make them a lobster. Oh, here we go. Well, I, I got one for you. 1,800 degrees versus 212. Choose wisely which one you want to hit them with. Because grandma steps out of her bedroom and she didn't hear the smoke detector go off, but she hears you tear the front door off and she steps out into a 1400 degree hallway because you didn't open the nozzle because you didn't want to steam her. She's dead. You erase that heat, not pencil it and drop it below 200. She steps out into a steamy, nasty environment. She's probably in shock. She may have some burns, but she's alive. Right. So I believe I would choose which one very carefully I do because when you go to court and ask you, Mr. Firefighter or Mrs. Firefighter, explain to me why you crawled down a 50-foot hallway with the answer to the, the saving lives and property with the nozzle closed. And they'll say, well, I didn't want to steam the victim. I didn't want to upset the thermal balance. I didn't, you know, all <laughs> the, the standard stuff we right. were taught. And you go, so you're telling me that the 1,400 degrees above them that was radiating down on the victim was not a problem the 3,400 parts per million hydrogen cyanide that would have contracted and lift off and was not a problem. And the 1,200 parts per million of carbon monoxide was not a problem to you because you're wearing the best gear money can buy in an air pack. But that kid laying there in Spider-Man pajamas doesn't have that. So if you're not making it tenable as you move, you're negligent. We're great at extinguishing the fire. We suck at making it tenable as we move. That's why I always ask this question. What was the temperature of the last hallway you crawled? And you say, wasn't that hot? Well, I'll bet you the victim lying on the couch would beg to differ with you. Right. No, that's one of those things. What did you say? Skin is destroyed? Is it? Uh, 162. Right. And it's crazy to me. But we don't mm -hmm. know that because we're carrying our, our, our three layers of thermal protection. And yeah. Oh, yeah. More than that sometimes because some guys are wearing two hoods. I didn't feel nothing. No, you wouldn't feel nothing. <laughs> you're not going, you're not going to feel, on average, you're not going to feel nothing until about 450. Wow. So what would 450 do to your kid? Yeah. That's what I always say. <sighs> you okay? I'm you need good. a break? <laughs> that is just a lot of information. I'm also going to catch you up. The officer that goes in with the team should have the tick. What's your opinion of the Seek Reveal Fire Pro tick from Luis Manuel Corona? What's your opinion of the Seek Reveal Fire Pro tick? Well, without violating any uh, NDA agreements, I helped a lot with that. And I can tell you that is a, a situational awareness camera and is designed for what we said in the beginning, finding my way out, finding my crew, finding the fire. It is not designed to replace a decision-making camera. Unfortunately, if you read the survey that was just published by firehouse uh, that we assisted with Joe DeVito and Mike Daly two other amazing thermal imaging instructors who helped with that, you will understand that 42% of the participants did not know the difference between a situational awareness camera decision-making camera in their department bought one thinking they could throw away their handheld by putting one of the cheaper ones in everybody's hands. Uh, the downside of that camera is that even though it's 320 by 240 resolution and 15 hertz, which is better than most uh, standard situational awareness cameras, is think about this. If you've ever left your cell phone, if I can even see the thing, laying on your dash or in the sun a little too long, what happened to your cell phone after it sat in the sun for a little bit? Yeah, we're gonna come on. It said too hot for use. If I laid all the cameras you could think of in front of you on a table and you looked at them and said, based on just sight, which one of these is most insulated and which one of these is least insulated? So I would challenge you to think about that camera in large amounts of heat and extended duration based on the five I have sitting in my closet that don't work they will overheat quite easily quite rapidly if i keep them in my pocket and i got it hidden over here for situational awareness and that's my get out of jail camera all day long but i'm not going to take that camera and use it in training burns i'm not going to use it as my go-to camera that is my get out of jail camera gotcha. i tell you what that camera is really good for is three in the morning and either one of you has one and mrs smith says i smell something burning in my house and i can't find it now I got three people looking versus one. Okay. 
And that's great for that. It's great for lost person search. It has the longest distance to spot ratio of any camera in the market. It claims it can pick up a heat signature at 900 feet. I don't know how they do that math because I got a little Excel spreadsheet that does it and it don't come out the same. So there must be something proprietary in there. I'm not supposed to understand about the math magicians because I got the uh, right over here, Algebra for Dummies book. Um, <laughs> that's, that's why I'm trying to get my daughter to be good at math. She can teach me. Right on. But, right yeah, on. but yes, it's a, it is a good camera for situational awareness, but you have to get used to holding it like a waitress or a waiter holds a plate too. So the majority of firefighters are used to holding it pistol grip or the flashlight style bullard camera right so now you've got to reorient yourself on that and the buttons are too small to work with a gloved hand so as i said in the beginning there's no perfect camera they all got pros and cons but until a firefighter builds a camera kind of like what dennis laguerre is doing with the hose industry until we get people like that on the thermal imaging boards and manufacturers and start doing that i don't think it's going to change i think they're going to keep telling us what we need instead of us demanding and telling them what we need. Right. Yeah. Um, nobody. Okay. I'm going through. Do you think it's possible? We had that one. Check out the grabs made in Texas this week on a well involved fire and heavy hoarding conditions. Many would have written them off. That's from Dave black. I have not seen that yet. So I have to look for that. Um, don't clean the lens. I'm saying, I think he's, Jeremy Hurst was saying, don't clean the lens with an SOS pad, please. So we're, <laughs> we're getting hot tips. <laughs> Jeremy's one of my guys. Okay. Him and Reagan, the Louisiana contingent. Uh, yeah, uh, we had an inc incident recently where we were, had two cameras of the same brand side by side in a fire. And the, the organization that had their camera said, man, mine doesn't look as good as yours, but it's the same camera. And one of my instructors in the back before I could say anything, I know, I know why, I know why. <laughs> so we go outside and flip the cameras down and look at the lens and their lens is cake, almost looks like creosote from where they've been burning with it. Right. They had cleaned it. Well, they gave it to somebody to clean and they used, I don't know, wire brush or something. <laughs> this is what the Germanian lens and scratched it and images, not good. In general, you clean a camera, soap and water, no solvents. And uh, if you clean the lens, you can clean it with alcohol wipe. But don't use solvents. Don't use a bristle. That's a germanium window, which is a thin piece of metal. And it does have a scratch coating on it. But think about, do we treat anything good? No. We right. could break an anvil in a rubber room. So <laughs> just remember that. That is the eye of the camera. If that's broken or it's clogged up, it's not going to see anything. No it's abrasive. Like glasses. Nothing abrasive. So, yeah, nothing abrasive, please. Only thing abrasive is comments, please. Uh, Thomas Blackman asks, what's the best way to retrain someone who has been using the tick wrong, like breaking bad habits? Uh, well, first, like breaking windows out with cameras, uh, for example. That was one of the first things my department learned. It's not a forceful entry tool. You know, you, you, you smash a window with it and you break out the germanium window and that's a thousand dollar repair. Dear chief, please take $50 out of my paycheck for the next how many ever months. Right. Breaking bad habits can only be fix by training and really instilling good habits. If I have a bad habit as an individual, no matter what it is, and therefore in order for me to break it, I have to repeat that good habit over and over again for at least what, 40 days? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well you work 10 days a month. So you're going to do four months worth, or are you going to do it on your own? Point being is it takes training and education. I quote David Eskew, a friend of mine. I'm only interest, interested in innovation and education together. Not either one individually, he says, because innovation without education creates what we have now. We have really cool toys. Right. And nobody knows how to use them. And then we have lots of education and then we don't have we have antiquated devices and we can't we can't use them properly. Well, I like that disparity. That, that analogy. I hang disparity. around smart people. I guess so. I That's like all it. I do. I don't have to be smart. I'm not the smartest person in the room. Never will be. <laughs> And part of partly the ability to say that makes you one of the smartest people in the room. Mm -hmm. And nope. so straight up, Luis has another question for you. And again, uh, I just throw it at you and see what you think. Cause some of it's above my, uh, Bullard, Bullard T3. What's your advice on when to change batteries? Half yellow, close to red. Do you recommend let it drain completely and then charge it? Bullard T3s use nickel metal hydride batteries. First of all, talk to your Bullard rep and see if they, I know some of their cameras are switching to lithium ion. If they can replace them with that, that'd be the first thing I'd do. 
because nickel metal hydride develops a memory very fast. So looking at the color bar on that and using that as your determination can get you hurt because I've used those where I've come off the truck and they were full. And by the time I got to the door, they were in the red. So if I based it on that, I'd be in trouble because they can develop a memory. And by the way, it's not Bullard's fault. It's our fault. Cause let me tell you why we shove a dirty camera back into a truck charger and expect it to charge. Those contacts are dirty. They're not going to charge well. And then if it's not locked in there good and it's bouncing up and down, every time it comes off that charger and back down, that's a cycle to that battery, mm. which kills it. That's why I said I removed truck chargers from, from the truck. I'd have base chargers only teach firefighters to change batteries with gloved hands, get that done. I mean, you put in your mask and everything on with your gloves. Why can't you change your tick battery with your glove? I mean, doing everything else with it on. And so point being, if it, if it's that battery, I would have one in my pocket. If you have a history of bad batteries, then you need to look at getting a, a battery maintenance program and saying, okay, every two years, we're going to change our batteries out. We're going to cycle them from the truck charger to the base charger. But if you read the standard, to answer his question per the text, each bar is supposed to be 30 minutes. So if it has four bars, it's supposed to last two hours, but that's in a 70 degree environment. It's not in a fire. Sure. So I would never go in a fire with less than 75% because I got horror stories of when I've done that and it didn't work out well. And I don't know about you, but I'm clumsy with the lights on. You put me in zero visibility and I'm going to change <laughs> the battery. And whoop, I drop it in zero visibility and now I'm trying to find it. And then here's the best part. I pick it up, I open up the case of the camera, and I shove said dirty battery into, oh, yeah. and I just took, it's like scrubbing open a wound and rubbing some Corona on it and hoping you don't get sick. You're going to shove whatever's into that camera and ruin it because that's the weak point when you open that up. So, yeah, I wouldn't go in there with less than 75%, and I'd have a battery in my pocket if I were you. That's just my advice because it's not if a camera fails you, it's when. It's technology, it's circuits. They're not designed for heat. No matter what they say, circuitry cannot take heat for a long period of time. That's why it's so well insulated. If you look at a camera, Corey, the guts of it's only about the size of a golf ball. So the rest of it's all insulation and battery. Wow. And if you, and if you turn one on, a newer one, the first thing you'll see on some of them is a red triangle in the top center with a little thermometer in the middle. That's called an over-temperature warning. If you see that in a fire... On average, that means the inside of a vacuum sealed insulated device is over 500 degrees for five minutes. Think about how hot that is inside of there and how hot it has to be outside of there to do that. You'd be like, hand me another nozzle. This one's melting. Right. I can't see my face pieces melted off. You're in a bad place. Okay. <laughs> it's not good. I hope that helps. No, it does. And, uh, we keep our MSA tick out of the charger and only rotate out the spare battery when the camera dies. What is your opinion on I think we already got his opinion because I see a thumbs up. You're doing it the right way. I would, if I come in and the tick's at 50%, I'd use that as an excuse to go ahead and do some training with it that morning. Play with it. Do something with it. Run it down. Drain the battery down and swap it out on the base charger like you're already doing. You, all, uh, you already got it. You nailed it. You don't need me. Brother, I mean, the, the viewers have thrown so much at you, and you, you have been a champ at, at fielding questions from them. I wanted to get to behavioral health. Sure. Um, and just, just, just to switch and, and pivot off the off your uh, the thermal imaging, because it is a big part of your mission and, and your life work is yes, behavioral sir. health. And I love the post you made last year about ventilation and fire behavior. We pay a lot of attention to ventilation. But mm -hmm. um, you made the analogy. It's a beautiful analogy to how are we personally ventilating our lives. And just kind of throwing well, that at you and talk about that. Full disclosure, I had a well-respected individual come after me for that post. Really? Uh, yeah, he said I was misleading firefighters with my information and I shouldn't be talking about my faith. Let me tell you something really quickly. You are who you are because of what you believe. Don't let anybody tell you different. You don't have to believe the way I do, but it's your right to. It's your God-given right in this country to choose who you believe in and what matters to you most. 100%. So if anybody tells you any different that your faith and your family doesn't matter, tell them have a nice day. Because what makes you a great firefighter is what you value. And purposeful ventilation means me getting things off my chest in a healthy manner, like a pressure relief valve that is that opens and reseats versus an overpressure disc that fires a frangible disc that blows out and kills somebody. 
I've been guilty more of that second one than the first one. And that's why I went and got help for my problem. And I still stay in accountability for it. Scott Simons, Reagan, all them guys know I have a little virtual accountability group. Everybody else goes to AA. This is mine right here. We have a little app. We talk like schoolgirls every day on it. Nice. None of our garbage goes on Facebook. That's not our psychotherapist. And if you don't respond, you get a phone call. And I got better friends out of state that would fly to North Carolina tomorrow to help me than I have friends inside the state. That's how some firefighters are. They're that caring. So if you think brotherhood's dead in your department, you're wrong. There are lots of great people who care. You just have got to meet them and they may not be in your organization, but I am thankful. I have a strong group of men that hold me accountable, lift me up, encourage me, set me straight when I go left or right. And I need that because if you vent the wrong way, as you know, as you said, Corley in a fire, we can cause irrevocable damage. You vent the wrong way at your job and on social media and your family. What did you just do to your kid, your spouse? What did you just do to your career? Because that one moment when I popped. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's true. Talk about white out in the camera. You went white hot. It's not good. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's good. It's very good, man. That's why I asked the question. It's very, it's a very good article, man. And I will, I get, I get anybody who says, I always talk about faith, family, and friends. And that's the three, the three legs of the stool, you know, the kill the flashover stool, but yep. uh, the faith, family, friends, man, if you're not strong in any of them, then you're doomed. It, yeah, you, you got to you can't stand. Right. And so it, it's, uh, I don't like, I'm with you. I don't care what you believe, but you have to have believe in something bigger than yourself and then friends and family, man. And they can be the one and the same. But anyway, uh, bringing back the brotherhood, talk to me about it, what it is about. Go ahead. That's just a very broad question. Uh, in 2007, I was promoted to captain and I'd been taking the engineer's test for four years trying to make a driver and took the captain's test a little ahead of schedule and passed it on the first try. Sounds good, right? It does. And then for three years, I went to work, had a good time, was completely unprepared, completely naive for uh, not the fires we face in the buildings, but the fires we face inside of people, inside of the four walls. It's 31 years old, 30 years old, actually, technically, and came 31 on when I got promoted. It's young to be in that position, in my opinion. And for three years, I handled that stress my way, which was the wrong way. And my wife politely informed me that I was bringing it home and that I, she asked me if this is still the best job in the world because I'm not acting like it. And she's telling me I don't have to quit, but I got to get help. So I went and got help and I still have help because you don't fight a fire by yourself. You don't fight these fires by yourself. First thing, stigma, people not wanting to get help. We eat our own. Oh, That's wrong. Right. That's the biggest problem right now is that you go into a burning building and die for somebody you may have never met, may not even like, but you wouldn't pee on the guy from A-Shift if he was on fire because he doesn't relieve you on time. That's, that's wrong, okay? You're going to lay your life down for each other, but you won't help each other at work. So that's how my journey started, and then I started writing. Then I sought counsel. You know, Bible talks about wise counsel. Sought out some great guys with Fellowship of Christian Firefighters, Keith Helms, Craig Duck, a bunch of other great people, Keith Rogers. The list is too long to name them all, but they really have guided me along this path. And all I did was start writing about my frustrations and and what I was dealing with and how, how I was being convicted and how God was changing me, not how I was changing. And through that, I learned that here's your choice, Corley. In the fire service, you can either, you have highs and lows throughout your career. You're never going to be, you know, one or the other. It's, your your struggle is not be flatlined. You're going to have ups or downs. But I, I learned that the fire service can be either a detriment, a spiritual detriment, or it can be an opportunity. And the choice is up to me because the world will tell you not to do anything. Keep it private, you know, secular privatization, what we talked about in church today. Keep it to yourself. Sorry, the cross you wear on your uniform says otherwise. That's a Maltese cross, eight points, eight Beatitudes. Read the study, uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five. That's where it came from. 
Knights of St. John. It's been secularized and dumbed down where it has nothing to do with God. But if you look at the roots of it, our very basis is he sat on a hill and preached and took care of 5,000 people. You go to work and you take care of people who have needs. That's what we should be doing is taking care of each other. That's where my stuff started. That's how I got into it and sharing my problems and preaching it myself. When you read something, Coley, it's not because I'm preaching it to somebody. It's a personal problem I've had. And I've taken, I got like 25 journals here. I've been writing in for the last 12 or 13 years. And that's what I do is I take that and I, I write a firefighter application, scriptural analogy, and like Jesus did with parables and tie it in and try to make it short, sometimes a little too long winded. Right, right. But um, I've learned if it's not 500 words or more, they're probably not going to read it. And if it doesn't have a cool picture, they're not going to read it. But last year, our brotherhood page got over a million views. Wow. And that's not something I did. That's the good Lord doing it. And my goal is to help firefighters find the help they need. And through that, I was able to write the behavioral health program in our department. I'm still fighting for that. I've got some great friends like Dina Ollie, who do some amazing work with North Carolina firefighter peer support. Next rung, the, the guys with that. There's tons of great people helping firefighters today. And the biggest problem in the fire service is the fact that we're skilled. We're awesome. We do all these wonderful things. We stink at helping ourselves. We'll help you when you get cancer or you have financial problems. But when you have a behavioral health issue, crickets. And that's wrong. Because wow. guess what? The number one killer of firefighters is not cancer, not heart attack, not laziness. It's the lack of caring for our own because it's suicide. Hmm. We kill we kill more of ourselves than anything kills us. And that's a fact. No, that's a hard fact. And we can fix that. Just like working out, diet, and exercise, right? We can take care of our own if we just recognize that it is a bigger problem than most people realize. And that's what bringing back the brotherhood is about. Yeah, it's literally trying to get people to focus on taking care of each other. And if anybody says, well, you say brotherhood, you're not including ladies. I need you to look at that word really closely. B-R-O-T-H-E-R. Brotherhood. It is a family. I'm not getting into any of this male, female, all this other stuff. It is a family thing in the fire service. We are one family. And don't, as Rick Lasky says, don't get your families mixed up. Your family at home comes first. But your fire family can be a huge support system for you if you make it that way. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, all right. Sorry. Um, uh, no. That's that's powerful stuff, and uh, I will go. I will say right now that you are on record as as I always write out questions that I want to ask the guest, and we might have gotten to three of them. So you have the record now <laughs> for the number. But that's because we had a really really good uh, interaction from the audience tonight, throwing so much at you. And um, brother, the, some of the questions you filled tonight were amazing, and just they were like model numbers thrown at you, and you're like, yeah, gone. Okay, so. With that I'm being said, play with overpriced flashlights. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're very well with it. Very good at it. Uh, I always ask this, if there is a book or books that you think firefighters should read. Well, it's tons of books and is quote somebody else. If you're not reading books, you're in trouble. Please tell me, let me just say this. Spend more time reading books and less time reading social media posts. Dude, I love that. that I'm going to make first, that into first a, rule. a post. First rule. Okay. Cause when you get your screen time report, like I do, if you feel convicted, that's a sign. Okay. You know, you spent six hours and 48 minutes per day on your phone. That's what mine said today. That's a full-time job on your phone. What if I spent six hours and 48 minutes in a book or with my daughter or with my wife instead of on Facebook arguing about which nozzle is best or which tick should I buy or whatever? Yeah, we should help people. Don't get me wrong. But let's don't get our priorities mixed up. Read. You know what billionaires do that other people don't do? They read. read. You know what successful leaders do? They read. They Preach. constantly search what the Bible says. They search for wisdom like it's gold. And you know what I learn every time I read a great book? I'm like, man, that guy or gal was amazing. And you know what? A great book like these sitting behind me do no good if they sit on a shelf. 
you know, just like if you have a particular skill set, you don't share it with somebody. If you have a particular knowledge, you don't share it with somebody. Share, 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 share. Like Kyle Romagus does with his his page. Sh shares. Lots of friends share stuff. Love it. But if I'm talking about books, fire service books, I would break it down into two areas. Okay. Where are you at right now? What role are you in? Okay. Right, you're, you're a firefighter. You're the blue collar guy or gal. And you are focused on mastering your craft. Amen. Good job. Well, please look at books that help you do that. Look at engine company stuff. Look at ladder company stuff. But don't don't take this the wrong way. But don't get stuck in ifs to Jones and Bartlett and whatnot. Okay? Because I had them throw out a question on my chief's test of one of those particular books that which shall, shall remain unnamed <laughs> from a 2017 edition that said, do not open the nozzle till you see fire. You will upset the thermal balance and steam the victim. Right. That was in a new publication. I wrote a two-page dissertation, listed people's names that died in fires that did what they advocated to do. So don't just read that. Read new stuff. Read research. Yeah, I know a 700-page UL report is tough to read, but you know what? Nothing easy is going to give you anything out of it. If you work for it, you're going to get something out of it. Don't ask somebody what the report said on Facebook. Read it. You need help, we'll get you there. But that's my job. I read really boring stuff and try to make it into interesting stuff. But read stuff you're interested in that will help you. And the other side of that, Corley, is pick books that will help you mentally, emotionally, and physically because the biggest problem with the fire service is we got some people who are amazingly skilled, but they can't have a conversation with somebody. They can't have a relationship with somebody, and they darn sure can't be in a position of leadership because they'll run everybody off because they're angry, they're bitter, they're hurt, they're damaged. And that didn't happen overnight. Right. A 23-year career where I'm at in my job, if I hadn't been around good people, I'd be in, in a white coat strapped up like this sitting in a room gnawing on a plastic <laughs> bottle right now. I'd be angry at the world. Because we sit in the morning and drink poison and look at the guy across from and say, I hope you die. It's not working. It is not working because I'm drinking poison. I'm drinking bitterness. I'm listening to all that. Read stuff that encourages you, lifts you up, supports you. I got a book right here I'm reading right now called Why Suffering. Why do bad things happen? By Robbie Zacharias. It's only 200 pages. Point being, this is more like an ERG guide than a book. I'm stopping. I'm chewing on this a little bit as my former driver Wally Martin said, I got to chew on that page for a little bit. I got to sit here and digest that. Read books that challenge your paradigm, that take you out of your comfort zone. You want fire behavior stuff? Look at Kill the Flashover, where my dad's organization started. Look at the books that are listed from those guys. 3D Firefighting by Paul Grimwood. Look at uh, the guys in International Fire Instructor Network. Look at all the stuff from UL, Stefan Svensson's, uh, my friend Roy from Sweden, all these guys are posting stuff all the time and very few American firefighters are actually reading them. They'll comment. They're not reading. Read challenging stuff to challenge you. You challenge yourself physically. You challenge yourself on the fire ground. Why are you not challenge yourself academically? Right. I love that. Awesome. But, yeah, I don't, I don't have a go to, but obviously my first book is the Bible but I love books that challenge and open up your paradigm and make you look at something differently than you did before. That to me causes you to grow and causes you to learn. And to think life. and to think for sure. Yeah. And, and to it. sit and wonder. <laughs> so. All right. We come to the point where I do this thing on the weekly scrap. It's called the five questions for firefighters. It's fun. It's been going on for a while now. So Andy Starnes, are you ready for the five questions for firefighters? Sure. Go ahead. All right. Question one. What is the number one issue facing the modern fire service? Oh, uh, that's a big one, but I would say, uh, application without understanding. We are really good at doing something, but we sure don't know why I could, I could show you 28 ways to force a door, but, do I understand the lock? Do I understand the door? Do I understand the purpose of the halogen, how it's made? Why is a three-piece halogen not a halogen versus a pro bar? You know, what's the differences in the le leverage in it? How I hold it, you know, a prop versus a real door. You know, application is great, 
But do you want a doctor working on your kid who's just really good at doing stitches or understands why he or she needs to stitch it that way? Right. You know, quote Aaron Fields, I need to know why before I can apply. Well, I like and that's that. the biggest problem right now, I think, is that we're a thousand miles wide and we're two inches deep and too many skill sets. Thousand if you have a subject matter expert or somebody who's really good at a particular topic in your fire service or your fire department, please don't demean them, slander them, put them down. Use them. Learn from them. I visit, I don't know how many states every year, and I come across the same people with different patches who are gold mines of knowledge, and their fire department hates them, doesn't use them, looks down on them. They'll give them a suitcase and go teach at a conference, and they're golden. Now, why is that? Right. Because that happens at every fire department, including my own. Did we eat our own? Is that the... the hmm. We don't value your opinion because we don't think you know what you're doing because we knew you when you rode the back and you were a numbskull like I was. And then we don't think people can grow up. We don't think people can educate themselves. We don't think, period. And we don't give people a second chance. But, right. oh, when it's all turn, quote my friend John Dixon, everybody wants accountability until it's their turn to be accountable. <laughs> until it's time right? to be accountable. Right? Oh, it's time, my turn? Oh, yeah. I, no. Right. So, Let's let's do that. Let's let's work on understanding and then we can apply even better. I'm all about sets and reps, but you better know why you're doing it because you could do it wrong 300 times. And to quote the guy who asked the question, how do I overcome a bad habit? How about learn it the correct way and learn why and challenge that why every single time. We just completed 50 hours of live fire training with the department and I'm reviewing 100 hours worth of recordings. And there was four videos that have challenged my paradigm about thermal imaging, about wow. things I didn't think about. That's four. awesome. That's yeah. That's awesome. And I'm like, I'm like, whoa, I've never seen that before. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, that's all. That's also a testament to how much you study. Cause like you just did, you know, how many hours did you say? Well, I'm sorry. What? How many hours did you say you just completed? Oh, it was over 40 hours with the department yeah, we were there for those 50. That's crazy. And the fact that you went in and found that and, and, and you were student enough to go in and find it. So anyway, that is awesome. I love that application without understanding a thousand miles wide, two inches deep. I love both of those. That is uh max point, sir. Uh, number two, what is the thing you are most excited about for the future of firefighting? Uh, I got a picture here. It's not my words, but this is really awesome. This so is preparation. That, I like this. So that same department that we went to at the end of every day, we do hot washes, you know, like an after action. Sure. And the battalion chief running it. And I can't find the picture, but I can quote what he said. We, I go around and ask him, I ask you two things. Get in class. What's one thing you want to learn in the class? What's one thing you learn and you're going to do differently. That's all I ever ask. You know what he says at the end of day two? He goes, I am so excited for the future of our fire department based on what I'm seeing in you today. I would retire tomorrow and re get rehired and ride the back of the truck and work for y'all tomorrow. This is a guy who's two years from retirement. Right. Says it. That's pretty powerful. And, and me and my guys are going, let's go burn again. Let's go burn. <laughs> We're like, this guy just gave us the biggest pep talk ever. That to me is seeing people who are motivated who learn something even though they've got 15 20 years on and they see something differently and they get that aha moment and they want to go back and do something with it. see that excites me yeah technology is going to change there's going to be new tools trinkets toys we're going to have all kind of cool stuff that by the time i leave the fire service that i never even thought of right. yeah that's great but it's going to be the same people wearing the gear same people doing the doing the the task what excites me is that I think this generation everybody's given a hard time to recently is actually more open to learning than people realize. You just have to, you have to find a way that gets them engaged. Connects. Yeah. And when you do that, that's a mark of a good teacher. You don't just spit out information. You study your audience before you get there. You identify their needs and their expectations before you teach. And as you're teaching, you adapt your message. So it, it rings and it sets and it and it goes into where it needs to be so they can make it work. So it's it's more about not a canned presentation, 
it's customized to the student and to the audience. And that's what excites me is when, when I left that department and came home, it's like coming out from a mission trip. Right. Come off the mountaintop. I'm ready to go back in the valley now. Ready to go back to battle because they, <laughs> they charged my batteries. They right. did. They charged 100%, my man. Battery. I feel that. It was, uh, it was good stuff. It really was. And I needed it because I hit some valleys really hard recently. <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, not, not the valley part, but yes, that you were charged up for it. No, yeah. I get it. And, and, and the other part is, is I wanted to ask you the question. One of the questions I didn't get to was, do you have advice for people who want to instruct, you know, and that kind of thing. And you, and you worked mm-hmm. that in there as a great, great. And so that again, max points because you answered a question I didn't even ask. And that's awesome. That's all right. Just, Number you're gonna, if you're going to teach, you better make sure it's something you love and you better make sure you're, you're willing to do it no matter what the cost is, because it's going to cost you a lot and you're not going to make money on it. I've got 11 years invested in this so far and people would label it as success to me it's significance. Is it able to contribute to the fire service? A, and I lay my head down at night knowing that we did the right thing and that we're doing everything we can to make sure that the message and the data is up to date and accurate. And is that what I'm doing? Is it adding to my family or taking away from my family? If it's taken away from my family, I need to reassess that. Right. Because I'm going to tell you, if you try to teach and you don't have your heart in the right place, there are two types of people in this world that see through BS, convicts and firefighters. Firefighters. You show up there and you act like somebody you're not, you won't teach long. They'll see through you. Teach That's you awesome. Um, question three. Uh, best rank or position to be in in the fire service, according captain. to captain. I would I'd go back to captain tomorrow. That was I had seven years on the best engine company I ever seen in my life. That's no accident, I love, you know. I love being a battalion chief. I think everybody says driver's the best job, but as a captain, you still get hands on. You still get to do a lot of stuff. Uh, you're still engaged. You're still getting dirty. Uh, you you take a beating. But I had seven years with some of the best people I ever worked with as a captain. And that was station two and shout out to captain Greg Nicholson for putting up with me for that time. I had amazing times there and I learned, I learned more from them than they ever learned from me. So, uh, I mean, most diverse area I've ever worked in, uh, most fire I've ever seen, most anything you could think of. I, that seven years was like, that's my keystone in the arch for my career. Now, my last five, I'm chasing airplanes and I'm learning a lot. It's challenging and I'm working with some amazing people. Right. And they are amazing in their own right, but they've all paid their dues too. Like you say, ARF, already retired firefighter. Yeah, I'm, I'm heading that way. But, you know, I had to give that spot up for somebody else to go have that amazing seven years too. So for me, that was mine. I like it. No, and I try not to give away the answers that it is max points, but company officer, captain, uh, whatever mm-hmm. it may be, but company officer is the right the right answer according to me, so max points. According to you. <laughs> uh, well, if you write the test, I guess you get to choose which one's right. I always like to listen to the arguments, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you 100% on that. You get to the, the relationships you form, the impact you have. It's just so amazing. Um, it question four. The best advice you ever received best advice I've ever received uh, was from my father when my daughter was born. He said, I can tell you a lot of things and I can't tell you anything that would be of super duper value, he would say, but he said this, he said, at age 40, I had more opportunities than I ever had placed before me. And the biggest mistake I ever made was I said yes to all of them. He said, just because it's a good opportunity doesn't mean you need to take it make sure it's what you need to do. So you'll have a lot of opportunities as life comes at you. Just make sure you have a checklist or a way to gauge that. Like mine's, this is going to help me in my faith. This is going to help me as a husband. It's going to help me as a dad. It's going to help me as a firefighter. If I say no to the first three and it's going to help me as a firefighter as a yes, then maybe I need to go back and reassess something there. You know, maybe you're changing ranks, positions, stations, shifts, going to daylights, whatever. Make that decision as a family. 
don't make it on your own when those decisions affect your family. You live because you're able to work. You don't work to live. We all going to have to hang up the helmet one day. We are. Whether you like it or not, you can be chief of the lawnmower, right? But your identity better not be hung up as a firefighter because one day you're not going to be a firefighter anymore, but you're always going to be who you were born to be, which is a servant and somebody that helps people. You can always do that. Just don't get hung up in the title, the rank, because when you die, it's going to say dedicated husband, wife, father, mother. It's not going to say dedicated fire chief unless you write that on there. Right. You know, you retire six months later, they say, Andy, who? What? What? <laughs> you know, you're gone. Mm-hmm. Your legacy is your family and your friends and the relationships you make. Strong. A thousand percent. That's good. Uh, final question. Uh, question number five, and it is heavy fire. And mm-hmm. I actually, this is the first time I've changed this question since I started asking it. And it's because of, <laughs> it's because of Sean Duffy and the uh, conversation we had last week. And it is now it is the question is heavy fire and searchable space. Mm-hmm. So would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? And I've been waiting to hear the answer to this one for a couple. Neither you know, one. Neither one. I'll be the heel man. I'd be the guy that does all the work and gets none of the credit because you're on a nozzle as Aaron field says, it's your birthday. You're having a great time. You're seeing fire, you're flowing water, but to quote somebody who was a better firefighter than I, I ever was, we did a drill recently and he was the heel man. And he said, you know what? I've always been on the nozzle. I never been back here. He said, man, that's a lot of work, but you know what? He would have never got there if it hadn't been for me. Right on. And I'm like, you know what? Where I've been most of my career is second or third back running, manage pinch points, pushing hose while they're having a great time. Point being is, in my role, I need to be back where I can see and help and look for things. I love being on the nozzle, but that's not my job anymore. My job is to watch over people. I can't do that if I take the nozzle from you, <laughs> which I will if you put it down. But that's only in training. In the real world, I got I to gotta stay in my lane. And I can't watch over you and do my job. If I get in front of you, beside you, I got to have that wide field of view and look at the big picture. And when you become a husband or wife or dad, mom, you're going to have the big picture. You got to look at that. And as my friend and mentor chief lamb says, put an index card in your helmet of those people's wives and kids. That's who you work for. So for me, being that backup person that nobody sees, is like the foundation of the house. You don't see that either, but it wouldn't stand without it. So, uh, and to quote Benny Clark, the further away you are from the nozzle, the more important you are. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. The drivers out there, you got my respect. So. Normally, I wouldn't give you points for because you didn't pick one of the one of the choices, and I would say it's a dodge. But I told you I was going to surprise you on that it, answer. It was explained so well, and you you quoted like four people in the answer, so therefore. Uh, it is not that. So, uh, <laughs> excellent job, sir. Uh, the five questions for firefighters, according to Chief Andy Starnes. Thank you, sir, for being involved in that. Uh, it you. is fun, and I enjoy it. The uh, it. best place to contact you. A few people have asked how to get in touch with you. Okay. Uh, you can go to my website, insighttrainingllc.com, and you can see the contact us button. You can uh, send me an email at andystarnes at instructorandystarnes.com. You can go on our personal uh, Facebook page. We have an instructor, Andy Starnes, uh, Facebook page. You can also check out my guys, instructor Joey Baxa, instructor Tom Sanderson. And I got a bunch of other guys working for me, too. They're not quite on the social media part of it yet, but they're awesome, and they're out there, too. Jake Ladson, John Davis, John Lightley, Sean Blonker, Max Firebox. If you haven't checked him out, I teach a lot for that man. I consider him one of my closest friends. Uh, check out his stuff. Uh my guys from the firehouse kitchen table, my accountability group, uh, check them out. One of them you heard Scott Simons is in that group. Uh, there's a lot of good people out there, but if you want to contact me, type in tactical thermal imaging on Google, you'll find me. Um, I've been saturating the market for a few years on that. And <laughs> I have a lot of opportunity in that, but that particular phrase, we try to, we've copyrighted and trademarked a lot of stuff because not because we're trying to keep people from using it, but you know, honestly, why we did all that is to keep people from getting hurt. 
because I had people call me and say, hey, I watched a YouTube video and I did some of your stuff and I had a near miss. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. You watched a YouTube video and went and did something? Uh-uh. You watch a YouTube video and go do surgery? No. <laughs> you know, so if you want to get a hold of us, you have a question, shoot me an email, go to my website, send me an email. Uh, we have a Patreon channel too, Corey. I don't know if you know about oh, it. I saw that. I saw that. Now you had like 80 hours of video available, I think is what and I said. I, actually, I updated it this week with some of our stuff we just got back. So basically everything that we used to keep on Dropbox and Google Drive and all that, we have it on a channel that doesn't require any of that anymore. Nice. So you go in and you're a pro member. It's 20 bucks a month. You can watch all of our pre-recorded webinars. You can watch our training videos, PowerPoints, lesson plans. You can ask for something and I'll put it there for you because I've got eight terabytes of stuff sitting here. I'm trying to sift through, but we'll put it there for you. We'll answer your questions for you. And then we have a private Facebook group called Tactical Thermal Imaging. If you type that in and hit join, you have to answer two questions or I won't let you in because I need to know you're not a robot or a salesman or whatever. Sure. Um, and we have over 800, 800 or 1,000 discussions and dot files and all that in there. So wow. Wow. That's lots awesome. Up there. And then we have 600 videos on YouTube insight training LLC. And then we're on Twitter, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, we're just very, very blessed to have the opportunities we have. And it's all because of the good Lord. We're just, we're thankful that we're able to do what we do. And we all got a limited time to do sure, it. So sure. It what we can, right? So, Awesome, man. So you mentioned the Patreon and that's, that's a, uh, when I was looking at that, I was like, that's an amazing value. Um, anyway, uh, and everything else, book a class, reach out the, all those things you just mentioned, anything you got coming up is, is there, I don't know what, does anybody know what's happening? As they say, that's all pending on Corona. You know, I've had stuff canceled and rearranged and stuff shows back up. So right now we just finished a class with Idlewild volunteer fire department here in North Carolina. We did a four hour max firebox thermal imaging class, and we're going to do two more of those. We're going to do one Monday night that's in Idlewild, which is right outside of Mecklenburg County or Charlotte. Uh, it's a Monday night at their station, and then we'll do it again on December 7th, I believe. And I don't have any other events other than webinars coming up. We've got a, uh, a tactical firefighting uh, lighting webinar that Fox Fury is sponsoring in December. We've got, we also got this week, it's a big one which I need to help with this one. We have Dr. Richard Gassaway, Rich Gassaway. Oh yeah. Situational awareness. Situational yes. awareness from the thermal imaging perspective. So we gave him access to all our stuff. He studied our stuff. He's taking his stuff, our stuff. And we're going to talk about situational awareness and improving high risk decision-making on the 24th from seven to 10 PM. You can go on our, uh, Facebook page and find it. You can go on Eventbrite and find it. That's where registration is. It will be recorded. So if you miss it because of run or had to put the kids to bed, you can go back and watch it. It'll be uploaded to our Patreon page. This one's going to be a good one. I mean, I, all of our stuff I think is good, but this guy, I mean, literally he has a doctorate and he's world renowned in what he does. Oh, no, no doubt. We're extremely excited that he was able to do this with us. So, I'm going to be taking notes the whole time. I'm going to get in trouble because he's going to say, right. and, and I'm going to be over here typing, taking notes, you know? So this, please, if you get a chance, sign up for that one. That's a great one. Uh, and then we're going to post another webinar. We always do a charity one in December. I've got to post it soon. So watch our page for that one. Awesome. And, and then we start, we'll start back probably second or third week of January. I'm having hand surgery on the 11th. Fix some old man problems. Carpal tunnel. <laughs> Building that ninja course. Yeah, yeah, I can't feel my fingers. Uh, and we'll start back strong then. We, hopefully, as long as Corona doesn't change anything, we have a busy year already ahead of us. Uh, February and March, uh, Lift Conference will be there for Louisiana Instructors Fire Training Conference. We'll be there. We'll be at Fierro Conference. We'll be in Calpin, South Carolina. If any of you are historic history buffs, that's a, a battleground site from way back when. Uh, we will have... Gosh, we got three live fire trains in there. Uh, April, hopefully, we get go to FDIC. We'll go to Poland if they lift the travel ban. Um, May, we've got some big stuff coming up. Hopefully, we'll get to go do those if they don't cancel things. And then the rest of the year is open at this time, but we're really looking forward to just getting out and doing more hands-on stuff again. And, Absolutely. And meeting more great people like you. So thank you again. Brother, thank you for being an unbelievably informative 
guessed and fielding so many questions. They just kept sending fastballs, and you kept knocking them out of the park. No, so, I hit I hit ground balls. I was never that good. <laughs> yeah, we, moved, we moved them around the bases. I can say that. I'll catch you up. Uh, ben Jones said, great show. Thanks, guys. Uh, uh, Sean Duffy said, gangsta grip. That fire scene is what he means to say. <laughs> uh, he also said, you're a solid guest. Chief is an awesome mentor and outstanding instructor. Hard to argue with. Mark alone said yes with seven S's. Probably Good more. Uh, yeah, he yeah. also agreed with you on company officer life because Mark alone got max points also. Um, yeah, he's a good Luis Manuel Corona said, the heel man, the unsung hero of the fire ground. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. there you go. Uh, Work cool. GG Colasso right. said, appreciate you sharing your knowledge. Thanks for a great scrap, guys. Learned a lot from Garrett Taos. Howard Reinwalt showed up and said, the great exclamation point. I'm assuming he's talking about Chief Andy Starnes. He said, I missed the whole thing with the facepalm. So he has to catch the recording. <laughs> It, that's an amazing dude right there. I've There's no doubt. There is no doubt about it. And Hannah you Ellie. Talk about I, passion? He'll light you on fire if you stand too close to him. Well, it's, <laughs> it's a great segue because he is actually the guest that follows you. He's coming on Saturday. So well, I will I will definitely make sure I log on to that one. So it's <laughs> going to be a good time. Hannah Elliott, who is a staple of the Weekly Scrap, missed it and said, me too, laugh out loud. So, Hannah, you were missed because we didn't get a question from you this week. Uh, and then finally, Kyle Hoke said, great role model. So there you are all caught up, sir. It was a unbelievably fun scrap, a super knowledgeable scrap. And I hope you had as much fun as I did, but I'm going to leave it uh, better yeah. off as a firefighter and definitely better off uh, with stuff to think about on thermal imaging that I had well, no clue cool. about before this started, even though I thought I did good research, you know? And uh, yeah, amazing. So... Thank you, sir. Um, uh, coming you. up on the scrap next week, finishing off November, Howard Reinwalt, after Thanksgiving, after the shopping on the 28th. After that, we've got LJ Geist out of Kansas, Mike Heaney out of Texas, Bobby Halton, then Scott Thompson, Walter Lewis out of Miami. I mean, it's a crazy packed up December. I think I have seven scraps planned for the holiday season, so it's going to wow. be a good time. And You're going to be busy. Oh, it's going to be fun. So I'm, I'm super excited. And uh, so anyway, thank you so much for making this one enjoyable. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and throwing so many questions at Andy. Um, again, phenomenal job. So I'll quit uh, and I'll say, I hope the tone stays silent for everybody. Unless it's burning, stay safe out there, everyone. Good night. Take care.